Yeah, yeah grab, a, grab a seat. There's a few in here. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, my name is Willis, uh, Executive Director of the Time Freak Alliance. Very excited to be uh, having this event in partnership with COE today. Uh, got a great lineup of speakers. Uh, and we're really glad to have a, a really good turnout because we also want this to be an uh, interactive, fun social event. So we're going to start with some presentations uh, to talk about greening industrial shorelines, um, some examples, some challenges. You'll hear from designers, you'll hear from engineers, you'll hear from community folks like myself. Um, and then we're going to transition to the second part, which is a breakout to talk about uh, these five uh, example sites that we've chosen uh, so it's interactive, and then we have drinks and food. Um, so yeah, there's also a bathroom around the side uh, if anyone needs. So uh, a little bit of background before we start. Welcome to the Queens Landing Boathouse Environmental Center. Um, who who's here for the first time today? Yeah, awesome. Wow, like 90, 95 percent. So um, this is a new space um, that uh, Newtown Creek Alliance is helping to run education programming out of. Uh, the Hunters Point Park Conservancy is the main tenant here. Tries he does a ton of work uh, in the park that we're situated in. Uh, and then North Brooklyn Community Boathouse is running boating program uh, out of this space, as you can see by all the boats uh, that are here. So uh, we're really excited to be part of this partnership uh, with the Parks Conservancy in North Brooklyn. Um, and so we do a lot of field trips, uh, education programming here. You can see some of the fish tanks with some local uh, aquatic species uh, present here. Um, I'll introduce a couple of our staff members who are here today. Gus as uh, our green space steward. Hart is our environmental educator who runs some programming here. And Brent is our horticulturist. Um, and um, I think that's about it. And, and I just want to, we'll introduce Jennifer later, but Jennifer has been the, um, the lead on this whole project, uh, works at COE, and has been really, you know, made this whole thing happen. So I just want to Give a round of applause to Jennifer. <laughs> Very humble. And um, happy Equinox. And to COE and uh, uh, COE Funded Foundation for, for making this possible. So um, I'm going to dive into it here. Uh, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Um, so I'll start my presentation and then we'll go from there. So uh, here we are, Greening Industrial Shorelines. So uh, our agenda, as we sort of mentioned, uh, the different presenters you'll see here. Uh, we are also re recording this uh, via Zoom, so we're looking forward to sharing that out afterwards um, with the presentations as well. So let's dive into it. Why industrial shorelines? So uh, one of the reasons that we want to have this event is places like Newtown Creek uh, and lots of area, other areas around the city, we have a lot of industrial shorelines that have not been maintained very well for a very long time. Uh, part of our concern at Newtown Creek Alliance is that of the 11 miles of shoreline we have on Newtown Creek, uh, we're not achieving the goals that we want to see happen. And we feel that the shorelines that are here uh, on this waterway should be serving at a minimum one of these four categories, whether that's supporting the maritime use that's here. It is designated as a significant maritime industrial area, uh, so it's very important to utilize that uh, where it's where it's feasible. Uh, ecological benefit, right? The creek is lost, you know, basically completely decimated from what it was a few hundred years ago. So finding ways to uh, incorporate ecological elements, big focus of this event, obviously. Uh, resilience, thinking about ways to, you know, deal with sea level rise and storm surges, and then public access. Newtown Creek has very, very limited uh, places where the uh, public can even uh, see the water, uh, let alone get to or, or, you know, launch a boat or anything like that. So this is the Newtown Creek Nature Walk. For those who haven't been here, um, is a great example of incorporating some of these elements. Uh, you can also see the maritime use that's there as well. So this is for us, you know, some of the priorities that we want to see happen on our industrial shorelines. Uh, what do our shorelines look like? These are some typical conditions that we have in places like Newtown Creek. Shorelines that have not been maintained in many, many decades. They were, you know, in some cases built on uh, wooden structures that have decayed over time. So a lot of erosion, uh, instability, that's a liability for the property owners. Uh, it's an issue, you know, environmentally for stuff falling into the creek. Uh, so this is a nice site by the Pulaski Bridge, uh, owned by Con Ed, highly eroded. Then we often get, and we'll talk about this a lot too, right? When there are interventions to rebuild shorelines, often they're very sterile environments steel sheet pile structures, 
uh, that don't provide uh, habitat for uh, invertebrates, for fish, for mussels and oysters and all the other uh, wildlife that is returning to the waterways. Um, so we do have a sort of mix of those. Uh, unprotected, this is the GMDC building. It's on the Greenpoint side here. Uh, you know, this is not, this wasn't sandy. This is a, you know, happens a couple times a year, significant flooding. Uh, so thinking about ways that our shorelines can protect uh, the upland properties. And then, you know, one of the big issues that we have is so many of the properties that are here have literally turned their backs on the water and there's very little access. There's very little consideration uh, for this natural resource uh, in folks' backyard. Um, one really, you know, important thing to understand about Newtown Creek, um, and obviously applies to other waterways like Gowanus as well, is the Superfund situation here. So, you know, the, the sediment at the bottom of the creek is highly contaminated. The EPA is still figuring out what the remediation plan is gonna be. Um, but as we've seen in other similar waterways, there's likely to be things like significant dredging, removing of that contamination at the bottom of the creek. And so what that means is that if you have an area like this, this photo on the left, and the EPA is gonna wanna say remove five or 10 feet of you know, contaminated sediment that's there, if these bulkheads are not you know, securely built, that becomes a structural challenge. And so like in Gowanus, they've done a lot of rebuilding of the bulkheads um, so that the properties are not falling into the water. So that's one is the dredging. Uh, the other is the navigation, as I mentioned, we are a maritime industrial area. So figuring out what the depths of the waterway need to be. Uh, the US Army Corps is currently looking at this with Newtown Creek right now, uh, but that's gonna factor in places where the creek needs to be 23 feet deep. That's gonna have some limitations on what you can do on your shoreline. Another uh, factor with Superfund is, is upland contamination. And there's many areas around <coughs> industrial waterways like Newtown Creek where you have pockets of contamination uh, whether it was a former, you know, oil storage facility or manufactured gas plant or what have you, and product contamination is literally seeping through the shoreline into the waterway. And this is uh, the Greenpoint oil spill, um, areas where it's still, unfortunately, we've seen it seeping through. So with Superfund, same thing like we've seen in Gowanus uh, and on Newtown Creek, you can put in, your shoreline can act right as a cap to prevent migration to the water. So this is really important to understand uh, as we go forward because it means that there's gonna be more attention on the shorelines of Newtown Creek. Uh, I wanna go, go through a couple of things that happened on the creek recently um, to sort of you know, give a little bit more context. Uh, so a little rapid fire here of a few sites. Uh, this was a site in Dutch Kills, old timber wooden bulkhead uh, that had not been maintained. They weren't using it for commercial purposes. Uh, for a very, very long time, wasn't maintained, rotted out, the whole thing fell into the water, uh, which was not good. The UC wasn't very happy about it. It's the state agency uh, responsible for these sorts of issues. So they were forced to reconstruct their bulkhead. And instead of having a flat edge, uh, the state um, you know, basically forced them to put a more naturalized slope, riprap, and some upland planting area as well. So sort of interesting example of uh, you know, something goes bad and that the state has the ability to leverage to make that shoreline a little bit better ecologically. Um, so that's one site uh, worth mentioning. Another that has not gone very well for us uh, was the street end. It's just a block block or two away from here, Vernon Boulevard. This was a, it's a public site. Um, it's an area that the community had lobbied for many, many years uh, to become a small little pocket park. Um, provide some benefit uh, to the community. And um, you can go on our website and see all the different uh, community visions that had happened really since beginning in 2000. Um, and then the city announced their plans to rebuild the shoreline with this elevated wall. Uh, for context, this concrete wall is about five to six feet high. Um, and then riprap on the other side. And we really tried to work with the city uh, we worked with SCAPE, who's here today. They um, put together basically a modified version of their plans to at least allow a little bit more access, incorporate some green elements. Uh, so unfortunately, this was a, a felt like a setback for us because it's public land. We felt like it should have been serving the public's needs and desires. And unfortunately, this is what we have. So not everything's great. <laughs> um, this is another example. We talked about contamination. So this was a 
Pratt Oil Works site on the Queen side of the creek. And this photo on the left was um, uh, from a few years ago. And so this was, again, old oil that was seeping out of the old wooden bulkhead there. And uh, Exxon, who had responsibility, uh, worked with the state and they put in a new bulkhead there. And as we talked about, that acted as a barrier and it's been successful. There hasn't been any oil seeping out. Uh, they also did an upland planting, uh, which is pretty nice there as well. So just a few sort of examples of some of the stuff that is happening uh, around the creek. So how do we avoid the sterile shorelines? And this is something we want to talk more about. You'll hear more in the presentations. But, you know, I think often, you know, there's a lots of people that understand the value of doing this, of not just putting in a metal sheet pile. Um, but also there's, there's barriers, right? So it's like we want more people to be thinking about this. Are there financial incentives, right? If you're a property owner, your shoreline needs to be replaced. It's, you know, in many cases up to you to spend the extra money if you want to incorporate uh, additional elements. And this work is very, very expensive. Uh, design innovation. We're fortunate to have some really uh, amazing designers here to talk about solutions to integrate that. Uh, so it's not just this sort of off the shelf, uh, you know, steel shoreline. Uh, permitting and legislation. So obviously the state has a lot of authority on, on what they're gonna allow property build, builder or property owners to build. Uh, so we wanna think about ways that we can, uh, you know, advance some of that on the legislative front uh, or give the agencies more authority uh, to make sure that there's ecological elements incorporated when you're rebuilding a shoreline. And then lastly, uh, NRDA stands for Natural Resources Management Assessment. And essentially it's a, a process that happens uh, often in tandem with, uh, with Superfund. And what it is is basically um, an assessment of the natural resources that were damaged or lost because of the pollution or the contamination. And this is happening for Newtown Creek. Uh, we don't know the full scope of it yet, um, but hopefully there's going to be a pot of money to be spent on restoring natural resources. And so that is a, an opportunity for places like Newtown Creek, as well as Gowanus, uh, to try and get some ecological elements uh, incorporated. Um, I want to give a couple examples of some sort of low-scale projects that have happened around the creek um, to sort of get people thinking. Uh, one is uh, the thinking about the cavities and the sheet piles where you have these crevices and being able to use that space for something. Uh, so this project on the left, uh, Gary, who I don't think is here yet, um, has been has been testing out, which is basically creating a structure. And they use actually the shells of mussels to create a mold uh, because mussels like to grow on mussels. Um, and they like all that little crevice and texture. So an idea about how you could incorporate that this was a sort of similar idea about, this is not built, um, but how you could have some very simple interventions uh, by you know, potentially welding metal. You could also do this in the design when they're installing the sheet pile. So you could use that cavity as a little planter space uh, to put some of the native salt marsh grasses. This was a project we did with Riverkeeper a few years ago. It was also making a structure that was gonna be good for things like mussels. And then these were actually suspended from the top uh, into the cavity, so they were very non-intrusive, um, but also not permanent. Um, and then lastly, some work that we've been doing uh, with LaGuardia Community College. I know that Professor Durand is on our way here, and also Carter Kraft, who's here, uh, has uh, taken a very active role in. And so this is the same thing, creating boxes that'll sit uh, in the intertidal level filled with the native Spartina grasses. Uh, so think about ways you could incorporate that going forward. Um, that's it. Uh, this is a beautiful marsh. John McLaughlin just walked in from DEP um, that John helped create in Dutch Kills. Uh, this is an industrial area and, you know, an example of how you can find creative areas to, uh, to implement some of this. So I'm going to pass it on to our next presenter, uh, uh, Matt from Coe, to talk about things from the engineering perspective. <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Matt Yamasaki. I'm a senior project manager with Koei. Uh, I've been with Koei for about 13 years. Uh, started out mostly doing industrial port work, but I've done a lot of different types of projects, flood protection, esplanades, 
public piers, uh, as well as bridges and tunnels. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of the inspection, maintenance, rehabilitation business that uh, COE does for waterfront structures, talk about some conventional rehabilitation methods, and then talk about a, a slightly different project over at the MCT uh, Manhattan Cruise Terminal, where we're doing uh, oyster sleeves on piles uh, as a demonstration. And I know we're talking about Newtown Creek today, but uh, I kind of like this picture of the Navy Yard to talk about uh, changes for industrial waterfront. I mean, this is still a very active industrial facility. You've got Lafarge, GMD, shipyards, but it's also, this is a little bit older. And I think, you know, the WeWork commercial office, there's some public uh, public park space now, the citywide ferry. So I think there are a lot of really interesting changes happening uh, for New York City's waterfront, uh, you know, all the time. And um, so a statistic a lot of us are familiar with at this point, 520 miles of shoreline in New York City, uh, it's constant, maintenance is a constant consideration. Bulkheads, piers, pile supported structures uh, are all on regular inspection cycles. The city has their own uh, standards for that, uh, that agencies like the EDC uh, use for projects. Um, and, you know, this is a lot of what we see, you know, just very dilapidated structures. Uh, things do not uh, hold up the life cycle in, in the marine environment. Uh, the, the deterioration is a lot faster than for upland structures. You have salt water that uh, is uh, uh, breaking down concrete, corroding steel at an accelerated rate, biological decay for timber structures and marine borers. Um, so it's, sometimes this kind of stuff can be a little bit shocking for people who don't do it day to day, but this is just kind of like an everyday thing. And, you know, these regular... Uh, inspection and maintenance cycles are just part of keeping everything structurally sound. And, you know, conventionally that can be quite sterile. So I think a lot of what you're doing is just pulling out the old uh, deteriorated elements and replacing them. So, you know, you've got a corroded steel pile, you're putting in a new one that might be galvanized or uh, cathodically protected to slow corrosion. But, you know, it's a lot of just pulling out the, the old and putting in the new. Um, chemical treatment or polymer wraps, that's another uh, way that we protect uh, structures. But, you know, it, it does tend to be, you know, quite sterile, uh, you know, which for an industrial facility, you know, is not anything that you might notice. But so this is something, uh, a project. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll hold the, the mic a little <laughs> So this is a project uh, over at the Manhattan Cruise Terminal where we're doing something a little different. Uh, so this is Pier 88. Uh, it's an, an active cruise terminal, uh, very, very important facility for New York City tourism. The Intrepid Museum is right uh, down the river there at the next pier. Uh, so it's just a demonstration project. So we have eight pot or 10 piles here with, that we've encased just conventionally. Uh, steel piles that got concrete encasements. Uh, and then these sort of uh, bands on the piles that you can see are oyster sleeves. So, and then, um, uh, sorry, let me back up. This was something that we, where Coe partnered with Billion Oyster Project and uh, Intertidal Habitat. It grew out of a PhD work that Andrew Rella did uh, during his time at Stevens, uh, where he did a similar demonstration project in Hoboken, but this was an opportunity to test it out uh, at an active uh, industrial or uh, an active commercial marine facility. So you can see the oyster sleeves on the um, on the piles there, and then there's this these uh, wave pumps that sort of passively move up and down in the uh, tide cycles or in wakes from ships, and they're intended to circulate oxygenated water further down into the water column to promote oyster growth uh, uh, at deeper uh, depths. So we'll, we'll get to those in a second. Um, so the project was constructed in 2021. So these are the sleeves. It's just a geogrid uh, polymer uh, uh, gr grid that was filled with uh, oyster shells and then incubated at Billion Oyster uh, 
projects facility and at Red Hook Terminals. We spent a couple of weeks in a tank there uh, to get the spat to attach to the shells. And then you can see on the right um, that they were installed. They've been out there for a couple of years now. And then um, the uh, that's the wave pump. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. It, it's a little bit of a, I don't know, Mythbusters kind of junkyard creation, but uh, it was it was interesting to see that come together. Um, so the the project has been successful so far. We've done one cycle of monitoring uh, and there's four more between uh, this spring and the fall of 2025. We're, they've found adult oysters growing within sleeves, uh, you know, really healthy growth. Uh, and this is, you know, a very active facility with heavy siltation. Um, we haven't seen them grow beyond the sleeves yet, but we're interested to see if they are something that propagates uh, uh, to, a, you know, to other piles at the facility. Uh, and then the wave, the wave pumps were not quite sturdy enough for the environment. Uh, they did end up failing, but it, it turned out that they weren't needed, that the oyster growth is healthy all along the, the height of the sleeve. And, uh, and you know, New York is was once one of the major oyster habitats for uh, North, in North America. And so it's just turned out to be uh, something that just wasn't needed to promote the growth. I think one of the big takeaways, I think for people who work on the waterfront, this will be no surprise, uh, permitting was, is definitely an ongoing consideration uh, to, to have the sleeves out there. There's an ongoing permit that needs to be maintained. And if the permit expires, then oysters have to be removed and nobody wants that. So there's this ongoing per, uh, permit maintenance. So that we work with the EDC to, to keep going. So that uh, is, uh, that's the project. I, th um, I think, you know, this is a small project, but when you think about the many, many thousands of piles over all the pile supported structures in New York City, you know, if this becomes an example for other facilities, you know, there's a lot of potential to make rehabilitation look a little different going forward. So. Thanks, Matt. That was really great. So next up, we have Gina Worth from Skate Architects. Give a presentation and some examples that uh, they have been working on as well. All right, you want to talk about that? Yes. Yes. So, Koei is a, a Jennifer will do when she speaks. It's the name of an engineering firm, and Jennifer will give a more background on that. Yeah. About I'll pass it to Gina to talk about okay, skate. We have some slides about skate. Yeah. Hopefully that will be helpful. Yeah. Uh, we're a landscape architecture firm. A landscape architecture firm. Skate. Um, so uh, thank you for the invite today. I kind of, I, I got to go oh, up. Okay. Um, I got to admit, I was like really excited about this and I pulled together a whole bunch of stuff, but I feel like my slides are maybe a little bit like all over the place. So have a little patience with me. Um, I also didn't have time because I was assembling it at 3.15 and trying to get in a cab uh, to list all of the collaborators on all of the projects. So probably many of you are in the room, like Koei's a collaborator on one of the projects. So there's many people involved in this work and I'm happy to elaborate more. Um, I just wanted to inter introduce myself. I'm Gina Worth. I'm design principal at Scape Landscape Architecture. Um, our Instagram handle is there on the right. Um, I'm also a gardener and insect enthusiast, and I'm a member of this really funky nonprofit research group called the Dredge Research Collaborative. Uh, and I did want to put in a shameless plug because this audience seems to be an audience very interested in like industrial waterfront and sediment things. Um, our nonprofit group just came out with a book all about like dredging and sediment and the wild constructed worlds we are making. Uh, it's highly illustrative and it has a whole chapter on New York City. So that's all I'll talk about today <laughs> related to that, but I did want to share because it's a, a labor of love. Um, but I did want to talk about SCAPE and who we are. Uh, we're a landscape architecture firm. We work at a wide variety of scales for a wide variety of clients. Uh, much of our work is united through the theme of 
urban ecology and water. So we work for public clients, for private clients. We're actually working next door here at Newtown Creek for a private developer. Um, but for the most part, we're building publicly accessible landscapes. That's our priority. Um, we're landscape architects, urban designers, planners, horticulturalists, uh, and we have three offices all nested in different water-based urban environments. San Francisco, um, New Orleans, and uh, the work I'm going to share today is out of our New York office, which is our home office and where I live. So we work all over the country. We try and bring these different goals to all of our projects, being ecologically aware, being highly collaborative, collaborating with engineers, with uh, community advocates with different agencies. Uh, we try very hard to think at the system scale, even though sometimes our sites are very, very small. Uh, and we try to think very much and work with communities directly um, on our projects. So I'm going to share a wide range of things, starting with some um, earlier work and recent, recent developments. I have cheated. Not all of my project sites I'm sharing are industrial sites. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to put that up front. Um, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, the importance of like constructing ecosystems. So, so Willis and Matt shared some earlier work on how to construct or reconstruct bulkheads and edges to add more opportunity and diversify the physical structure of those elements to add opportunity for habitat. That's very important in our projects. Um, and very early on when I first started at the company, we had some like very like big picture ideas on how to do this. Uh, this was a project called Oyster Texture that was proposed for the Gowanus Canal, thinking about the urban ecological habitat of oysters. This is a pilot oyster reef many years ago in the Bay Ridge Flats, which ultimately helped kind of seed the Billion Oyster Project. Um, thinking about how important it is to bring these species back to New York City's urban shorelines, thinking about the life cycles of these species and how at different phases in the life cycle, the species could nest itself within the urban environment of the constructed edges of New York. So here was a kind of thought with this project about how oysters could be raised and grown in portions of a cleaned up Gowanus Canal and then brought out to wider constructed, constructed harbor areas uh, and seeded in like large scale oyster reefs to protect the city. Um, this was like a museum exhibition concept. It became reality uh, in a very different way, in a very different context when we um, advanced our project called Living Breakwaters, whose COE, uh, the engineering firm, is a partner on, along with many other talented engineers. Uh, and this is a project where we're thinking about like standard engineered structures. So not an industrial shoreline, but a, a kind of engineered structure and how to rethink it to promote underwater like intertidal and subtidal habitat. So this project, um, Living Breakwaters, is uh, under construction today off the shoreline in Staten Island, um, outside of Conference House Park in Tottenville. Uh, and it really thinks about this more layered, uh, diversified um, edge that promotes underwater and above water habitat. Um, some of the design details in this project are really thinking about designing for specific species like oysters, other shellfish, and particularly structure-loving thin fish, uh, especially juvenile fish. And so some of the techniques, like typical breakwaters, are very linear. Um, our forms are modified slightly uh, and then modified to add more localized um, site scale, scale complexity and micro scale complexity. And they're oriented with these little fingers that we call reef streets towards the waves so that the sediment doesn't build up within the um, reef streets and creates more porous habitat and maintains that like micro, the micro texture that's really important for juvenile fish and other shellfish species. So this was the project in the competition phase. This is the project kind of under construction today. Uh, and these are some of those reef streets extending out. So you can see that we are using relatively um, typical uh, like stone, like armor stone materials, but also supplementing those with more innovative materials like an ecological concrete cast here into a tide pool. We also have other units kind of embedded within the structure that um, host oysters and have like little kind of gabion like edges to host other ecosystems or habitat types within them. Uh, and even today, while the project is still under construction, it will be under construction for, I believe, two more years because it's a very long term project. Um, you know, it, it is beginning to kind of support a more diverse array of marine life um, out in the harbor. So while this is not an industrial shoreline, it's mostly park and residential community, I think there's a lot of concepts here that could be applied to like a riprap edge along Newtown Creek. 
Um, also a really old oldie but goodie, you know, that project is like a 70 million or plus the many, many millions of dollars embedded in that project. Um, we also have done some more like experimental projects. And I think one of the benefits of um, publicly inaccessible shorelines is that uh, they often can be better sites for experimentation because you don't have to worry as much about vandalization or um, ADA access or other kinds of uh, elements that often can make uh, shoreline planning very expensive and, and challenging. So if you don't have public access, maybe there's interesting things you can do. Um, this was, this was uh, done many years ago by Escape. It was a kind of fuzzy rope installation at the Sims Pier, which is an active industrial site. It's part of a um, recycling facility uh, in Sunset Park. Uh, and the owner and operator was interested in doing something. He saw the uh, oyster texture exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art and was interested in these concepts and invited us to do something for like a couple hundred dollars on the pier. And so that wasn't a very big budget for our office to work with, <laughs> but we did host what we called a fuzzy rope weaving evening and use some materials that are used in the mussel cultivation industry called fuzzy rope to kind of test this material out in the maritime environment. Um, it had no live species on it. So it was just trying to create substrate for more diverse growth. Um, and we literally had community members come out and help us weave these, these nets. They are temporary. Um, they are still there today, though they are temporary. Um, and they have been uh, kind of populated with a, a kind of interesting array of like expected and a couple unexpected species. Uh, and so they have hosted uh, rib mussel and other mussel species on them um, as we also use them to kind of test some of these ecological concrete panels. Uh, and they are being monitored um, by members of um, the Brooklyn College scientific community. So very small scale kind of concept, but I think useful to share. Um, so moving on to more recent work, uh, I wanted to talk about some post-industrial shorelines and the challenges of like designing along the waterfront edge, because pretty much every project Scape has, uh, uh, you know, we're often commissioned by um, residential landowners um, to like that are building large, you know, multifamily mixed-use complexes along the water, not unlike these buildings here, to design the public shoreline. And pretty much in every one of those projects, we try and promote like a salt marsh or a gap down or a step down. Uh, and pretty much in most of them, we don't end up with those in the projects because of the exact reasons that Will has mentioned. They're expensive. There's not an incentive to do them. In some cases, uh, with certain parts of this, the way the zoning used to be written, there was a disincentive to do it because those tidal ecosystems didn't actually count as part of the public space. So like your developer had to not only set back 40 feet, but an extra additional feet to like accommodate those ecosystems. So it's been a little bit of like an uphill battle, but um, I'll show you some of the results that we've we've achieved or started to achieve, and you can decide if they're successes or not. Um, but it's just a very interesting space to be working within. Um, I think we've been collaborating very successfully with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. I guess it's like Newtown Creek's little sister, <laughs> um, maybe like big money sister. I don't know, like <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in there. But uh, um, helping the Gowanus Canal Conservancy like develop this vision for the Gowanus Lowlands, uh, a kind of network of parks and public spaces that amplify and create a healthier urban ecosystem along the canal and create more space for people. Um, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy saw just like you know Newtown Creek is is anticipating change with Superfund cleanup, the GCC saw the change that was coming. They were facing resilience issues. They were facing Superfund cleanup underway. They were also facing a large rezoning um, where there's uh, large um, residential buildings and mixed use buildings being built in the neighborhood today along these waterways. And so this framework plan was help, meant to help guide some of those changes. Uh, you know, the industrial waterfront, we think of the waterfront as the moment where the water hits the, the edge, the urban edge, um, but in reality, in all places, not just the Gowanus, the waterfront is defined by the historic footprint of the marshes and mudflats that shape the area shown on the left, as well as today's present day hydrology, the kind of underground network of storm sewers and CSO points that interact with the canal, as well as the risks um, with future flooding. With today, there's flooding in the Gowanus, coastal flooding, um, and also in the future, there will be more coastal flooding um, in the Gowanus. And this neighborhood is dramatically changing. And so a lot of what that change involves is 
adding a big tall bulkhead to the site. So you see this here in Newtown. We see it a lot in Gowanus because of the super fun cleanup. That bulkhead is required in some capacity. And a lot of the complexity and life that's able to be hosted in the deteriorating condition on the left is not able to survive in the condition on the right. Um, so with the GCC, we thought of different ways that we could think about um, adding more ecosystem vibrancy to these bulkheads, but also ensuring that people can still get down to the water, right? Because one of the changes is with, when you have these bulkheads that are designed to these taller elevations, you end up with this kind of bathtub effect. Like if you're down at the water level, you're just surrounded by walls, or if you're up at the water, at the bulkhead level, you know, there may be 10 feet or 15 feet between you and the water, which is a challenge. Um, so we developed like a bulkhead decision-making matrix that we shared with landowners. Um, I don't know how successful we were, <laughs> but I do think uh, we did work with many landowners to kind of end up in this middle ground where the bulkhead um, was able to be uh, not tidal, not creating tidal ecosystems on private sites, but lower. So there were still like, opportunities to get closer to the water designed to be floodable because it will flood um, and have high ground, like a high ground esplanade that is protected and lifted and up at the you know correct flood elevations. And so we thought about like different ways that these edges um, could appear and look within the urban environment. Maybe there could just be like a tidal strip of planting. Um, maybe there was an appetite or ability to have planting, but there could be step downs and access to the water. Uh, and maybe some places we, we're working on sites where the, um, the bulkheads and the landscapes are low, but the public access is high and on a pile supported structure so that the water can just come in and below, vegetation can go up and through, um, and that uh, doesn't require like a big bulkhead investment. So um, here's, here's one recent project. This is the first um, esplanade we've recently constructed along the canal. So very proud of this work. This is with 300 Huntington with Monadnock development. Um, it includes public access to the waterfront. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out in addition to like a bunch of like great public spaces and a, a cool lifted grove and kind of a tiered resilience strategy uh, is this client was not interested in engaging the tidal edge with a tidal wetland, but we did get what we call a future tidal shelf in this project. So you can see it wrapping around the bottom there outside of the public walkway and railing, this kind of thinner planting shelf, which is, um, I think, set around elevation uh, five or six. So it's out of the typical high tide range today. In the future, it will be more and more inundated and it has the ability to kind of transition to this different type of ecosystem over time. Um, we've also worked with a number of different developers uh, to even get like itty bitty moments where you step down to the water. Uh, and so in the, the, the middle of this site in this project, we have a little water access get down moment, which gets you down to like elevation four, so that will get wet in like king tides and high tides. Um, same with this project here. But this work requires so much coordination with an engineering team. It requires a designer to come in early and like advocate for this. Uh, it requires the coordination with the actual engineering of the bulkhead to make sure that you have tie backs like organized for the bulkhead outside of the zone where you want to step the edge down. Um, and so it takes like years and years of like pre-thinking. It's not difficult, but you have to like do it and have to be at the table at that moment for those things to happen. Um, we've also had more great successes with um, some of our public clients uh, who are more aligned in terms of um, being interested in investing in ecosystem design. And so um, at the Gowana CSO tank facility in Salt Lot, where our client is the DEP, um, <clears throat> this is a large site where a, a combined sewer a storage facility is like a big tank is designed below this entire uh, landscape or portion of this entire landscape. There's a kind of building and other elements on the site. There's also the future home of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy and some composting operations. Uh, and we were designing a kind of public park on top of all of that. And so one of the things we were able to do in this project uh, is actually take the bulkhead edge here and pull it into the site and create this large kind of bite out of the site and the proposal for a large scale tidal wetland, or at least large scale for the tidal wetland that exists in the Gowanus, which is very minimal today. Um, so I see this as a real success, and it's really to DEP's credit that they um, are, you know, kind of both advocating and advancing this design concept um, that does incorporate tidal wetland ecosystems and that gradation from shallow water to upland uh, transition zone into the design. 
Um, I also wanted to just call attention to uh, the little canal get down at the very top right of the screen in this project, because I think the way these urban industrial sites change over time is like really interesting, also kind of heartbreaking sometimes to watch, you know, like, because this was a site that was a kind of like impromptu garden that the GCC developed. And I think there's many spaces like this at Street Ends at the end of the uh, Newtown Creek. Um, street Ends are often like these contested spaces where all the agencies like kind of have their own goals and nothing's really coordinated. <laughs> so they're very difficult to work with them. Um, you know, so if you're like a landowner, the image on the right is probably terrifying to you because it looks like your site is eroding away. It looks like a public hazard. Uh, you know, if you're a kayaker, it's awesome because you can get down to the water. Someone stored their boat there. Um, and, you know, this is also the site where like a little tiny salt marsh was developed. Uh, this is what this site looks like today, right? So, this, you know, if you're a coastal engineer, you're like, thank God, this looks awesome. Like, it's secure, it's stable, it's not going anywhere. It's supporting this future industrial facility. But, you know, from a boater's perspective, it's like not the um, not the greatest. From a habitat perspective, it's like obvious what's happening. Um, and then this is the future proposal for the design at this, at this piece, which is in the project. Um, we're actually proposing to like, Re redo that portion of the bulkhead within this piece of the site, cut it down, cap it, and create this like public access ledge with planting and stone stabilization. So it's kind of a, a repurposing of this existing bulkhead edge into this new um, kind of public access condition. So just because it exists today doesn't mean it can't be changed. Um, and then I'll just wrap up because I think I'm over time. Uh, this is just one final project. At, um, uh, Bush Terminal as Pier 6. Uh, this is a project that's still in active design process. Um, it's a five acre filled pier that's being transformed into a park. Um, but I, I wanted to just showcase it today or end with it because it does have all these same like erosion and deterioration issues um, that many of the edges of the uh, Newtown Creek has. Um, but our concept plan for this project has, I think, a really beautiful and interesting kind of park program moving forward on most of the pier, but we've taken a portion of the pier, the forested part, and um, we're calling it like a process of designed erosion. There's likely going to be some kind of um, like stabilization line kind of drawn in the sand, and then this forest is going to be allowed to like erode over time and remain as inaccessible kind of habitat. Um, and so it doesn't become, um, you know, an expensive thing to like upgrade or stabilize. It's, I think the, the kind of whole idea here is like maybe less is more in some conditions and context. So um, I'll, I had like a bunch of summary points, but I think I've gone a little bit long. So maybe I'll just like wrap up there and we can talk about these later over drinks. <laughs> Thank you. Well. Great, thank you so much, Gina. And yes, lots, lots to discuss. We realize we're sort of going through these presentations. So the um, the second part of the event, as well as the social hour, are going to be good opportunities uh, to talk more with all of our presenters and all of you. So next up is Marcia Johnson, who works for New York City Parks, uh, also teaches at um, uh, City College uh, in the landscape, landscape architecture program. And um, and yeah, March has been great. She's been so involved in a lot of stuff, both around here in the creek and the harbor. So we're really excited to hear uh, from Marcia Johnson. Thanks. Thanks everybody, it's good to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so just a little bit about me. I know you probably, you just have to do an hour and something of a presentation. So I'll try to keep this a little bit brief, but. A little bit about me, I uh, did my doctoral work at Penn on the post-industrial waterfronts of the late 1980s. Before we had the Hudson River Park, before Brooklyn Bridge Park, a lot of those post-industrial edges were naturalizing. And so I looked at the ecology of those wilding areas of post-industrial waterfronts. And then I've been thinking over the last 30, 40 years, how they have moved into the design uh, features that they are today. So what I'm going to do is show you a few park projects. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, just press this. Okay, go. 
So I'm gonna, since I work for the New York City Parks Department, I'm going to show you a few of my city park projects. These are all on public land. All of the work that I do is on public land. And um, this one in particular, Hudson uh, Harlem River um, Park at uh, Esplanade, I wanna acknowledge Carter Kraft who brainstormed with me back a long time ago, uh, around, the, around the time of 9-11 about how to do a demonstration of waterfront parks that have ecological value along their edges and how can we you know, demonstrate how that could be done. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show you a few park projects and then I'll discuss some of the features that um, industrial sites can incorporate to have side-by-side -side habitat along with um, some industri industrial uses. And um, then uh, I'll also talk about um, some target species in the East River, which of all of the things that we talk about habitat, there is a subset of the organisms that are probably more likely to take advantage of that created habitat. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then um, just the principles of industrial cells. So characteristics of the 19th century industrial areas uh, included a lot of features which we don't necessarily have to replicate in the 21st and 22nd century. Um, and those include completely hard-edged linear canals and direct discharge of wastewater and waste products into, into the waterway. Um, we don't need to have bulkheads everywhere. Um, we don't need to have it closed to the public everywhere the way it used to be. And we don't have to have it zoned only for manufacturing. There are lots of the waterfront today, which is being zoned for mixed use. And so that's an important difference that, that uh, allows us to not have to um, do what, do, just replicate what the old industrial look, look was like. Um, so a few ways in which industrial waterfronts can be compatible. Shores that can adapt to sea level rise. They don't have to necessarily always be fixed at the same elevation that they are today. We should accommodate, we should anticipate and accommodate um, sea level rise in the shorelines that we're building. Um, ecological enhancement features that could be attached to piers in Newtown Creek. I think you guys have been trying some sugar kelp. There are many other places where, um, including the, the wraps that Matt was talking about, um, oyster friendly wraps that can go around piers, lots of textures that can be added to in, um, infrastructure that encourage um, attachment organisms. Um, we can look at the target organisms and instead of just talking about the vague idea of habitat, we can look at specifics and say, here's the fishery that should be here, that could be here, and here are some features which would encourage them, as opposed to trying to, you know, do it all. And um, having having the infrastructure have multiple functions and improving the water quality, creating infrastructure which actively improves water quality, adds aeration, adds oxygen, adds diversity changes the, the volume or the velocity of water so that it's more conducive to organisms set, setting up business. Um, I'm gonna sort of skip through this, but a lot of the features which are considered tried and true industrial um, engineering features aren't that long lasting and they don't work all that terribly well, even for the intentions that they originally had because we know they're falling apart. So we should be rethinking some of these um, approaches that include very high carbon impacts of concrete and steel and a few other things. I'm going to sort of shortchange a little bit so we can move along. Um, so some of the things that I've explored <clears throat> along with many colleagues and collaborators and other, um, other folks in, in the world of waterfronts include coves, which are little cut-ins, little inlets, so that the water that's moving by um, sh slows down and has a little change of direction. At Harlem River Park, we created tide pools, I think the first tide pools that were um, designed in, in uh, New York City with the advice of an uh, environmental artist who had been working on tide pools on her own separately. 
um, Jackie Brookman. And so we have a place where water from the from the river can, um, at high tide, come into a little shallow spot and at low tide go out, allowing the public to have access to shallow water in a safe way that's the real water instead of being separated. Um, uh, this portion of Brooklyn Bridge Park, the first component of Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, includes a little cove, which was already kind of there, but we kind of kept it. And just to illustrate how dynamic the shoreline conditions are, when we first constructed this, we put shells all over these rocks so that there would be um, there would be shell uh, shell material to support the habitat. And over the years, that all moved around. The shells disappeared; they got cr crushed and moved off into the waterway. And the gravel moved around. Um, so we see visual, we can li literally see visually, uh, the public can see visually how dynamic these, um, these beaches and shorelines are. Um, the porosity, along Harlem, the Harlem River Park, um, the bulkhead was replaced with um, gabions. So these are boxes of net, netted uh, boxes of rock with oysters and shells on the outside to encourage a living crust of organisms and provide uh, flood storage or river water storage in the footprint of the park instead of repelling it and keeping it out, allowing it to be a part of the floodplain. So coves, porosity, and um, floodplain function. This is Randall's Island living shore <clears throat> during construction. This is a phytoremediation project. There was contaminated soil on this site. Phytoremediation is a big word that just means you use plants to cleanse the soil, cleanse water or, and or soil. And so we planted a variety of different kinds of um, plant communities, all natives, to try to bring down three common contaminants of what's called historic urban fill. All along many of the shorelines, we have a rep repetition of the same kinds of contaminants. Lead, mercury, and PAHs, which are carcinogens, are among the most common ones. And they're also the ones that we won't we'll really worry about because they have a direct effect on human health. So we planted a variety of different kinds of communities to try to lower the contamination and uh, post-construction photograph shows the um, variety of, di of diversity of habitat, as well as these um, little portions of inlets along the shoreline while we conserved the um, historic wall. Uh, we provided, um, along the shore, we uh, consulted with EcoConcrete to create these, um, a series of tide pools, they were intended to work as a system so that you would have three or four together replacing some of the stones. That didn't turn out to be as easy, easily installed as possible. So they're they're more or less separated and singled. But oh, next to each one is a tide, um, is a survey marker. So you, the general public, could go and take a look and see what the tide level is. And over time, and these are at different levels, um, the idea was that people would be able to educate themselves about what it's like when it's high tide and 20 years from now, high tide is going to be at a higher level. Um, along the shore, we have this existing wall with this unstable top. So we took the unstable stones and made terraces and used bioengineering techniques where you put living plants in between non-living elements to create a series of terraces. And this is kind of what it looks like now. One of the things that I've been very interested in about for a long time is how do animals adapt to turbulence and the, you know really um, adverse conditions in the intertidal zone, and how could some of those ideas be added to the architecture and engineering of infrastructure? So just a few ideas. Uh, if you look at the way many shellfish are that are attached uh, to rocks, uh, their, their shape is streamlined so that water flows off. Also, many of them are corrugated, like they, uh, the, you look at them and from plan view, they have these little edges. So a very thin shell 
is made stronger by that court, just the way cardboard is corrugated and makes it stronger. And one other thing about um, these intertidal zones is that many of the organisms have sacrificial arms or elements. They, it doesn't, they don't, they're not set up to remain uh, stable. They're set up to um, lose a few um, things and then be able to regrow. If we could figure out how to do that in infrastructure, so we have some self-repairing. There are some materials which are self-repairing. There's some fabrics which when you puncture them, they pull together and they just close up that puncture. That would be a very interesting thing. It would also maybe get us away from having to build massive, bulky, expensive structures. One other thing to uh, kind of note also is the inland migration of shorelines. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about erosion on the shore. Usually uh, in any kind of uh, waterway, sed sediment moves from one place to another. It doesn't disappear. When we think of erosion, it sounds like, oh, well, we lost the feet. We lost 40 feet, 40 feet of beach, or we lost this, you know, this whole cliff just collapsed. That goes somewhere. And after Sandy, there were some photographs taken that show very clearly the in inward migration of our beaches. So here is before, and here you see the sand moved up onto the um, onto the uh, the beach berm. Here, the beach moved up into the neighborhood, and that was was described as erosion. But in fact, it was just trying to move inland, which is what things what shorelines do during periods of high of um, sea level rise. If we could accommodate, if we could figure out how to move our shorelines, create shorelines that are adaptable to moving inland, we wouldn't be fighting against the ocean as quite, quite as much as we're doing now. So at Randall's Island uh, Living Shore, we uh, have these terraces, but the intent is that as sea level rises, these um, grasses will be drowned out and they will move up to the next terrace. And these will no longer be uh, in that location, but they'll move up to the next terrace and so on. So creating an opportunity for shorelines, including the plants and animals that go with them and the pollinators that go with them, uh, moving inland as this all happens. Replacing some natural floodplain functions. I'm gonna just skip through that. And adding ecological value to hard infrastructure. So during the pandemic, our engineering group asked me if I would do a little research um, on what could be stuck onto walls, added to piles, to um, not have to change the engineering, but would just you know add a scrim or a screen of, of additional um, ecological value. So I did um, a, a bit of a research project. I looked at the what has been done around the world. And here are just a few of the things. Some of these have, have already been done in New York, New York reef falls in which Water, as it goes through these underwater hollow balls, um, is actually sucked through the water, uh, sucked through the ball. So it, it creates its own kind of circulation because of the way those openings are shaped. Many places have tried putting textures onto um, structures in order to get um, algae such as this vulva on, ulva on there and uh, then other organisms attach themselves to the algae and eat it and so on like this. There are many uh, types of textures are affected, affected that way. Talking about the fuzzy ropes, uh, one of the things that's a really hot topic in this area is, is supporting eels and the baby eels, which are called alvers, with um, what look like fuzzy ropes or ponytails. Um, they're um, uh, or, uh, called eel mocks, and they provide habitat and hiding places for these little tiny clear eels. And that's one of the, the one of the organisms that is um, uh, of high concern in this area. This is from Seattle where they were concerned with the salmon um, runs. And this is a glass above the seawall that lets light come in here and uh, has created a very effective um, way of supporting salmon moving through their uh, young salmon feeding on those walls. So what are some of the organisms which are in the East River that might be most likely to take advantage of some of these things? So this is a, a chart of many of the fish 
uh, finfish that are in the East River. Of those, and I interviewed a handful of uh, fisheries experts, and we came up with this list of what's possible, possibly worthwhile to put uh, to put our attention to. Eels, oysters, we already know we're talking about oysters and mu uh, mussels and oysters and other shellfish that are filter feeders. But there is also the biofilm microorganisms that come onto things like the fuzzy rope and onto textured uh, that, uh, fabrics and other textured uh, structures. Um, tube worms and inver invertebrates of the rocky shallows, because we have a lot of rock and we're constantly putting in more riffraff. And the fin those finfish, which will feed in shady shallows uh, and some crabs, and then the sessile seaweeds and so on. So of all of the possible organisms, those are the ones we might want to spend the most attention on. So just wrapping up, um, key concepts about trying to add ecological value to industrial sites is to, one, reuse the site resources as opposed to wiping clean and starting with new concrete and new steel and new plastics and so on, trying to make use of, reuse of the existing materials. Adding porosity, I think, is very essential so that these floodplains have some additional way of um, behaving like floodplains, holding water, increasing the diversity of substrate and slope. One of the things that, about Hudson, about Harlem River was we took the straight line and made it zigzagged. And that did a lot to change the velocity of water along the edge, which made it slow down and allowed for sediment to fall out and different, they just have a variety of different conditions along the edge. Um, conserving the existing natural features. All of these Superfund sites that I'm familiar with um, aren't trying to conserve any of the natural bottom or edge or anything. It's like cap it all, build brand new, get it all clean. While I respect the perspective of doing that, I think it's also essential to start to look at trying how can we conserve some of the natural features while we rebuild the urban uh, edges and make everything have a have a value in terms of um, adding to water quality and of course planting native species in communities. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> thank you for the choice. Thank you. I just want to I just have to say uh, I want to also acknowledge the funders for many, many of these projects, which include the Depart State Department of State. Uh, the Parks Department and Randall's um, Alliance, Randall's, Randall's Island Alliance. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Martha. Yes, Fund, funding is always, uh, always critical. So um, thank you all. We're going to transition to the second part of the breakout group. And so I'm going to introduce uh, my partner in crime for this event, uh, Jennifer Norton, to uh, give a little intro to the breakout and what we're going to be doing. And yeah, that's it. And I'll also give a more thorough introduction to co leaders for those who are unfamiliar with the firm. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, on COE, so my name's Jennifer. I'm an environmental specialist with COE. Oh, you can't see everyone. Hey, in the back. In the back. Um, I'm an environmental specialist with COE. COE is a Danish engineering firm. In the United States, they mostly focus on structural elements of design, so bridges, offshore wind, um, tunnels, uh, marine hard structures, and I'm in the marine group. My back, so that's COE. In Europe and Scandinavia, they do all everything we're talking about here, and it's a little bit more broad reaching in North America, it's structural engineering. So today, I'm going to bring together everything people talked about and try to shepherd us into why we're here and getting your feedback on these five sites that we have uh, up across the room. So my background, I've worked uh, nonprofit management for government, municipalities, managing stormwater, uh, from monitoring to construction planning, and then now I am an environmental specialist within a marine engineering group. So the what they're asked to do is very different than what you're asked to do when you're planning for a watershed or when you're a city who has to answer to the state. So um, the purpose of this event was twofold. One, to network, 
to, to have all of you guys bring your energies across the chasms where you work, whether it's uh, education, ecosystem function, hard structural marine elements where you want to make sure that the, the waterfront stays where it needs to stay. We want to bring that information together and get your insights on how we can incorporate green elements into these sites we have across the room. So I'm going to quickly walk through that. So again, after today, we're going to capture all your thoughts and put it in a matrix and share back to you all a matrix of insights for how we can get more green elements in up to our industrial waterfronts. So that's number one. And then number two, we also want to get examples of partnerships you've seen that are successful or products that you've loved. Uh, both uh, Marsha and Gina were both giving examples of project uh, products that I already have listed. So we want to grab more for both for owners and public projects. All right. So that's what we want from you. We want your insight. We're going to create a matrix. We're going to email it back to you. Let's uh, Let's be honest, and I'll quickly run through the challenges when you're doing developments on the waterfront. Marine infrastructure is very expensive. It is like why you're talking millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So it's very challenging, much less when you start adding in the cost of cleaning up contaminated sediments or not removing them and how you incorporate and work with them. It's just very expensive. So that's one challenge. When you're monitoring ecological elements, this when you put an ecological element on the project, the state wants you to monitor it, which is great. We want that data, we want that information. But that's a whole another administrative uplift that an engineering firm or a landscape architecture firm may or may not be equipped to manage. And so it just adds this element of complication. If it's not brought in early, it can really inhibit a firm or a public planner wanting to incorporate that to a project. I have recommended reef balls on a project, and um, I think I'm talking fast. I think I'll slow down a little. Okay. I've recommended reef balls. He's like, go, go, go. I've recommended reef balls on a project and had a public client say, we can't monitor them. Safety is a, a big challenge. Um, some sites do not need public access, but they could still have opportunity for ecological enhancement. Some industrial waterfront sites are not safe for the public. And so we need to divorce, in my opinion, that ecological habitat equals citizen access. It's great when you can have both of them, but it's not always appropriate. And I think that would help our movement here. You guys can read the rest. I will say scope limitation is often a challenge for the engineers I work with. They're told to, to check out the structural load and design. They have no, that's all they get. They get a very limited component for that. They've talked about the potential solutions. I'm not going to, I'm just going to jump through this. We want you all to share more of these with us, and then you're going to get all these links back at you. So if you have solutions or project examples, send them to us. We'll include them in the matrix. This is a project that you can read about later, her time, but um, McKenna Seema in the Bronx utilized a fantastic way for a developer to walk through how to design properly through the, it's a wedge certified project and it helped increase resiliency, ecology and access. Uh, Joseph with wedges here, he can talk about that. This is a way for, for owners to understand how to think like what we're talking about and how to incorporate these elements into their design. Lastly, I wanna thank uh, the Coe Foundation. So. COVI, as they say it, the COE Fondin is, it stands for COE Fund. It owns 80% of the company I work for. It's a foundation. It's a Danish foundation. And this event you're at today was funded by a grant to support Newtown Creek and us as COE hosting this event with the two goals of networking and to create that matrix that we co-share across our different disciplines. All right, let's get to it. So... For the scenarios, we have uh, we have listed basic shoreline type, and then we've zoomed into the habit the opportunity we think is present, be it habitat, habitat and public access. There's a maritime need, or what else could happen. So that's that. There's some information at the bottom. This is simply the parcel, and we want your insights. We have post-it notes by color, but it's okay if you use the wrong color. <laughs> For maritime use, ecological value, public access and resiliency, and really what I would love to glean from your mind, which is really not easy to do, 
when you look at this site with your professional background, what's the first question you ask? Where's the closest compost site, right? Where's the closest uh, access for the channel? What, what questions come to your mind when you think about adding in green elements? So that's that. And then secondly, we want you to share with us these overall solutions that come to mind. Again, the project specific and partnerships. That is all I have. I will say there's landscape architects in the room, there's educators in the room, there's community players in the room, there's a engineer diver and marine engineers in the room. So have at it and Willis, I'll let you take it back. Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. So, um, so we're gonna start our breakout. We'll just um, move some of the chairs um, so again, these are five different sites that we chose. Uh, they happen to all be on Newtown Creek. And um, there's also some great maps that are around um, here as well. So there's a few, there's one here and another one here that show some of the floodplains. They show where these sites are. Uh, because that's another thing we want to consider is that not all these, you know, whatever you see here that inspires you, this might be, we might be thinking about habitat, but the site might also need protection from sea level rise. Um, also want to give a couple more shouts. There are two of the property uh, owners in the room, at least. Um, so if you have questions about some of these sites, uh, you can chat with them. Uh, also one of our other staff member, Sandy, is here. And Sandy helped design a lot of the posters and visual elements as well. So I'm going to give Sandy a shout out. So um, that's it. So we'll have breakouts, use the post-its, and, um, and you know, let's fill these in with things that you see as opportunities for, again, whether it's resiliency or or habitat or access. And again, we're not saying that all these sites have to fulfill any of those. You might say there's no opportunities for doing anything creative here, but we want to, um, you know, think about all this. So, yes. So the red line, does that mean it's all that's, that's the parcel. So we're looking specifically at these sites because they're, they're owned by one property owner. Yeah, um, you're, we're assuming that these, all these facilities are going to remain in their current uses. And so thinking about what are ways that maybe you could add some elements into the shoreline structure that might be beneficial for some habitat, or maybe there's something else. I mean, they're challenging. Some of these are very challenging sites, which is uh, the nature and why we sort of chose them. So Jennifer and I will float around and we'll also help provide a little bit more context about some of these. Um, but feel free to go crazy with the post-its, put them up there, write your ideas, draw your designs, and uh, and then also we have uh, beverages and food in the back as well. So does that sound good? Any other guiding questions? All right, so we'll get started. We'll move some of the chairs out and uh, go from there. Thank you all.